a spot-on introduction to our next panel, which will grapple with one of the absolutely core questions in the energy transition. Think about that word, transition. Going from here, one thing, to another over time. But over how much time? Should the pace of change be even, or should it accelerate? And what are we asking is the role of fossil fuels? and in particular, oil in a low-carbon world. So to guide this discussion that we absolutely must have right now, here is Vikram Chandra. Welcome. Katie, thank you so much once again. Well, it's great to be here, and what better place to talk about the transition? Because we're here in the Middle East, of course, we are here in the UAE. This is an entire region which has been built but partly by fossil fuel, part oil, gas, that's driven the economy for a long time. But as you look around this entire region, you're seeing the increasing realization and an increasing desire to move beyond, move beyond fossil fuel, the transition uh, that was just being spoken about. So how will that transition be built? What are the options? How can partnerships be built, including with India? Um, that's what our, the subject of our next session is going to be. So let me welcome onto the stage uh, Fazil uh, uh, Abdul Rahman, who's the Group Vice President, Sustainability and Climate Change at Dhaka. Uh, please, please do come and join us. A utility doing fantastic work in generation, in transmission, distribution. How do you make the transition? Uh, is something. Please, please grab a seat. Is, is something we we'll look at. And and it's a great, great privilege to uh, call onto the stage Mamta Varma, IAS, who's the Principal Secretary, Energy and Petrochemicals at the Government of Gujarat in, in India. And clearly, Gujarat, a state that has played a very important role uh, in the entire petrochemical sector, also some of India's largest refineries are there, and how are you handling the transition is something we'll also take a look at. Um, but Mr. Rahman, if I can just start with you. Across, across the Middle East, across whether it's, it's not just the UAE, when you look at other countries, Saudi Arabia, uh, other places, there's this, there's this increasing signal that there is a realization that the era of fossil fuels is, is limited, is coming to an end, uh, not because the oil is running out, but because the planet is asking for greater sustainability and other solutions will have to be found. And there seems to be a realization that just as the Middle East led the entire world in the fossil fuel era, there's a desire that you would like to lead in the, in the next era as well. Definitely, I think uh, they see it as a risk of course, uh, oil has been driving and still driving quite a lot, the backbone of the economy. But the countries here doesn't want to stick to one option of generating the income. So that's a realization which they have. And if you see recently, especially in the last decade, there's a lot of emphasis on diversification of the economy. Whether it is on the tourism front, whether it is on other sectors or infrastructure sector, uh, there's a big focus. And in fact, what is actually driving as an iron is the money which is generated from the oil and gas sector. I think, I think the mentality or the realization is that, yes, globally, the demand of oil and gas uh, will come down. The region expect to play still a larger share of that still, mainly because just the sheer low cost of producing that oil and gas and steer low intensity of production. But they do realize that from a medium to long term, that's not where they have to be and they have to venture into other sectors. So that's why you see whether in utility sector, manufacturing sector, there's a lot of dependence moving away from oil to gas and then more and more towards uh, renewables and nuclear. In fact, uh, even from a Thaka perspective, last year we took a leading stake alongside uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company in a company known as Mazdar, which has renewable energy globally. Again, uh, the driver for companies us in utility and in oil and gas like Atnok is make sure we have our foot ahead in terms of investing in renewables, not just here, but globally. So yeah, there is a clear realization that they have to diversify. Right. But that you, from, from your point of view, do, is this entire concept of a transition, is this something that a state like Gujarat, for example, would have very high on its mind? And also, uh, many of the companies, as I was saying, one of the largest refineries, Jamnagar, is, is in Gujarat. There are petrochemical industries out there. There's uh, large ports out there. Um, is that what the feedback you're getting from others also? That there's a finite time, 
but we better start managing the transition. Yeah, actually, you know, these days everyone is talking about energy transition, but from the state perspective, if I have to say, you know, that we have taken it very seriously, and uh, uh, our Honorable Prime Minister sir, has given the vision of Panchamrit, you know, and India has to become net zero by 2070, and uh, 500 gigawatt has to be, you know, added in the entire capacity by 2030. So, for to achieve those numbers, it's also very important for the state to have good policies, and also to act, you know, so that we are aligned with the government of India's, you know, target. And at the same time, our manufacturing, uh, because Gujarat is a highly industrialized state, we have, you know, three, we have the largest refinery in Jamnagar, we also have two other refineries. So what is now happening in our state is that in the manufacturing sector also, the industries have started realizing it, and they have realized that definitely they are going beyond oil and gas. And uh, so a lot of focus is there on green hydrogen now, of course, it will go first because we are a, we, in our state. We have good presence of refineries, fertilizers company, and um, the other uh, where hydrogen is used. So, as a state, we are basically now, you know, being positioned uh, where the largest production of hydrogen is going to happen. So, the the companies are basically they. We have come out with a land policy. The companies are already in the final stages of you know uh, deciding on on their you know projects. And now they are looking at hydrogen as definitely as one of the options. And other options, which in our state is quite high, is the renewables. So, for solar and when we already have the in the entire country, we contribute to about 15 percent of the renewable energy is being contributed by our state. And in the solar and in the wind, we have about 12 gigawatt, and we are now looking at offshore wind also. So, I think through this, uh, it's important that we, you know, we continue this journey, and we are very sure as a state, we are very sure that we will be achieving this 50 percent of our energy is from the renewables by you know, much before, uh, you know, 2030 or so, by 2028, 29, we will be achieving you that said, target. You said 50%. 50% of our energy. 50% of the usage in one of India's most industrialized states. Yes, yes. You're saying would be from renewables. Yes. Uh, and would that be largely a bet on green hydrogen or the other? No, no, it will be do? largely from the solar, wind and hybrid projects. You know, solar, wind, hybrid and offshore wind. Okay, that's, that's actually a... An interesting number and, a, and an encouraging number. Um, when we were talking about the transition, I think one of the first questions that I, I'm sure people are going to be asking, including this week right here in the, in the UAE at, at COP28, the question of time. How much time is this transition going to actually take? Because climate activists and others will say, we are, we've already run out of time yet. 2% is more or less there. We need to move faster. The industrial world needs to move faster. Is there a sense of a clicking time and the sort of timeline you think people have to make this transition by? Definitely. I think uh, people have been conveniently talking the word transition, but the question is when exactly and how fast enough, right? I think. And is there going to be a cliff at some point? They say, okay, enough transition, you've got to have a particular defined date by which you've got to start meeting these deadlines. De definitely. I mean, see, we as a corporate, we see a lot of pressure on the ESG agenda from our fixed income investors. I mean, although we are 98% owned by uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, Abu Dhabi Holding Company, a lot of investments come from the bond investors. Uh, you like name the BlackRock, AXA, 50 plus bond investors globally. Now, what was one question to our CFO in the finance calls on ESG uh, as a namesake question uh, a couple of years back? Now, 70 or 80 percent questions are dominated on this one because there are much more stringent requirements on them before they invest money into, say, fossil fuel projects or coal projects. They are looking at the ESG ratings of the companies, right? So, so that is actually pushing the corporates to make sure when they do the financial planning and capital allocation, they integrate ESG into the mix. I think the clearly, as you said, the need in the upcoming COPs is actually to have short and medium term targets. I mean, of course, you know, 2050 and 2070, there is a convenient thinking that, okay, let's do everything maybe after 2040. But the fact is the more and more greenhouse gases which you have in the air, the impact is already there. So it's high time uh, we have to go for the target setting, bring it back and accelerate it. I think echoing what uh, you said, ma'am, what we did as a company was we recently updated our 2030 targets. Initially, we had an ambition of 30% renewables by 2030. What we did, because of our acquisition of Mazda, we increased that to 65% by 2030. Yes, we know it is a stretch, but the fact is unless we put that big numbers up front, the commitment won't be there, especially from an investment perspective. So that's interesting. I mean, here is a utility 
in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, and you're seeing 65% from renewables uh, by, globally across by the portfolio. Yeah, exactly. or globally across the portfolio yeah. of, of, of all the things that you're doing. Right, uh, if I could, you know, for, for a country like India, of course, uh, and India is meeting those climate targets, one of the few countries that actually is, it, the, there's also an economic imperative because at the end of the day, India doesn't produce that much fossil fuel, it's importing the fossil fuel. So the extent to which India can move to you know, wind or solar, it's, 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 it's a net good. When you're talking to people, not just in Gujarat, but to other colleagues, which are the areas where you think India can have a major advantage and be able to scale really fast in renewables? Would it be wind? Would it be solar? Would it be green hydrogen, which we're hearing so much about? So I would say that all three, but you know, it also depends on the uh, 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 on the opportunities and also the the kind of strength you have there. For example, solar is like India everywhere solar can happen. Wind can happen only in few states. For example, Gujarat is a very high potential in wind. Tamil Nadu is has, having. And then uh, offshore will also be, you know, restricted to some, you know, location. So, and even in green hydrogen, the states which are having the ports will have a major advantage. For example, Gujarat, we have almost 40% of India's cargo is being handled by our port. And in terms of the uh, gas, uh, LNG, almost 82% of LNG, uh, you know, is being handled by our ports, you know, in Gujarat. So I think green hydrogen, that is why Gujarat becomes a very strong state in terms of having green hydrogen production because it is also very near with the port. It can also be, you know, exported well and uh, transported well. So that is why I feel that, you know, but you know, in terms of having, so uh, all the states, they are having, they are in a different stage of, you know, progress or development. And for some state, it is probably, in, in some state, maybe hydro potential is more. For our state, we are looking at more, you know, on both. And now, plain vanilla, solar and wind, we are not promoting. We are promoting more of hybrid, you know, because you can get more CUF out of there also. And it can also meet the peaking power requirement also. And just to give you one example, like as a state, we had, you know, from the beginning, we had this vision, you know, where we went for a very good, uh, you know, mix of energy mix we went. We also, we have thermal energy also. We have solar, wind, we have gas also. And gas has played a very major role in meeting our peaking power requirement. So that's how I think as in India, because we are the fourth largest in terms of renewables now in the entire world. And I am sure that the, the India is going to play a major role in, in enhancing Thing, you know, or addition of renewable capacity is there, and definitely in green hydrogen, yeah. So, you know, there's traditionally been a system, I mean, the grid is now improving, and the grid is starting to become much better. Traditionally, what used to happen was a lot of the coal would be produced in eastern parts of the country, and then literally transported on, you know, on, 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 on trains to other places where power generation would happen. Do you see that starting to change, where states like Gujarat, for example, can start producing more of that electricity directly and then just directly wiring it across? So actually, it also depends what kind of a strategy you develop. Like for example, in our state, we also get some coal from the eastern side, you know, or east coast. But at the same time, we also have a lot of imported coal-based plants, you know, where we get through our ports, you know, we, we get imported coal. But uh, at the same time, it's very important, you know, to now go for the decentralized, if uh, decentralized solar or wind generation, which basically manages your grid well, and it is it and it also you know it's very effective in terms of having no transmission losses also so those decentralized solar or the wind you know generation is very important then you also need to have good big parcels where big projects can also come. For example, in Gujarat, we are doing the world's largest uh, hybrid power project, you know, uh, wo both wind and solar. It's 30 gigawatt in the India and Pakistan border. So this kind of a big parks also are very important. At the same time, decentralized generation is also important. So I think it has to be a mix of all. And right. then only we will be able to meet the demand, especially, and one of the major challenges basically to ensure grid stability. Uh, because with the intermittency of this power generation and uh, it is injection in the grid, it is very important to maintain the reliability of power. So all these, you know, and, uh, strategies are... And especially if a larger component is solar, because solar, you, know, you don't get solar yes. generation at night, there could be cloudy days, and so therefore the fluctuation uh, actually builds up. I just wanted to get your sense of how Dhaka and the UAE and the Middle East in general looking at India, this entire 
concept of the IMEC that we've been hearing so much about in the last few months is really the closer integration of, of India with the UAE and other countries in the Middle East. Nothing new, by the way, that integration dates back centuries, if not uh, millennia. But from your point of view, as you're looking at generation, as you're looking at transmission and distribution, um, I'm sure you must be keeping as a factor that, look, here is the most populous country in the world, not that far away, and possibly those connections can be done with India, which then um, enables a lot of that generation to continue to happen here and be shipped across. Yeah, I mean, not just the most populous country, one of the most growing countries, so the potential is uh, high. I mean, if you look at the UA-India trade numbers, it's, it's accelerating, it's not just increasing. Uh, and it's a, that strategic relationship between the UAE and India only seems to be getting stronger, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think uh, when we talk about energy transition, I think there's always emphasis naturally on generation. But, but as they say, there is no transition without transmission, right? I think that's an area where there needs to be a lot of investments. You did mention when it comes to system integration, the variability. I think, I think something we as a company have been piloting successfully and expanding it bigger is actually connecting various systems. So in, in UA especially, a big part of the net zero target is there's a lot of captive plants in the manufacturing sectors, be it oil and gas, steel and aluminum, who produce their own electricity. But one of the plants is actually connect them to the grid and uh, give them the benefit of the nuclear and more and more solar in the grid, something which we're successfully doing with ATNOC. And early this year, we announced a similar uh, strategy with, uh, together with investments with a company known as x in UK. The idea being one of our countries of Operation Morocco. Uh, it's a long-term project, but we definitely see that as a way forward. We built 10 gigawatt of renewables in Morocco, and then we have one of the world's largest interconnection projects to the UK. So the benefit is energy security issues, especially in the Europe, it is being tackled. Second is the variability with different time zones can be solved to an extent. So there's a lot of potential, I believe, say between UAE and India with the distance and a lot of reserves in the system. Just like how you mentioned connecting the right. east versus west of India, just another connection from here could do wonders so I was actually. Just, I was just in fact that, uh, thinking about that. So if you can connect Morocco and the UK with the HVDC uh, line and you know, sort of pipe the, the electricity there, it's probably a shorter distance from the UAE to India if you put a HVDC line this way. I, I, ideally, you, you, you should believe so. And, and uh, I think with the Middle East and India, I think one thing to keep in mind is the growing demand. So it's actually one way of solving the problem and sharing uh, whatever you have, the spare generation or the variable generation effectively. That's something to be definitely explored for. Well, Mantaji, if either those pipes are coming or that, that cable is coming, it'll probably be landing in Gujarat. No, no, so. I'm, I'm, I'm offering you, you come and invest in Gujarat. You know, sure, sure. you produce, uh, you know, energy there and, you know, uh, and there you will not even get solar. You will get both solar, you know, wind and offshore also. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, come and invest over there. There's definitely We've got three more minutes in this session. After that, we can get, a, we can sit outside and, you know, <laughs> finalize all the details of this particular project, you know, immediately after that. Um, just, just looking, you know, at the at the challenges in the transition. What, to your mind, are the biggest challenges that you are seeing? But Why aren't we moving faster? I mean, that's a question that a lot of climate activists are going to be asking. Uh, Why I, is the transition not happening faster? I, I think one is the legacy assets of the, this part of the world, and of course, uh, India have right. I mean, there was a stage where we're building up natural gas assets and oil and gas assets, so that is one. I think second is when it comes to the system integration issues, that's, a, that's really a challenge. You talk about solar, the levelized cost of electricity, but end of the day, there are a lot of, the way you're going electricity on one side is changing, so there's a lot of integration challenges. Third is uh, mindset. I think people think decarbonization more of a threat. I think there has always been and still an issue in terms of seeing that as an opportunity rather than as a threat. Fourth is financing. Uh, there are still a good number of section of investors who still are much more focused, mainly because of a short-term return focus on the fossil fuel assets than, uh, than on the renewable assets, right? So, so it's, a, it's a combination of all four aspects which I mentioned for me. Uh, there have been progress, but again, I, I think it goes back to the same point that progress needs to be accelerated on all the fronts. Right. And what would be the challenges according to, uh, according to you? I mean, I know in, in, in India there was a, a long period where we felt, and I think correctly so, that 
it's not our fault all that's happening with emissions. It is the developed world which has done it, and therefore the developed world should pay in common and differentiated responsibilities. Now I think there's the greater sense that we should do it in any case for our own sake, not uh, and for the planet's sake, whatever the, whether the West is doing it or not. But what, to your mind, are the major challenges in this? So, in terms of, I'll uh, you know, I'll split into two. You know, in terms of uh, you know uh, renewables, I would say the challenge is now that. Uh, uh, sense is there, there is a vision also and people want to do it, but the challenge is more on the ground level, you know, we need to basically sensitize the uh, the the local people, you know, and in the transmission, energy evacuation system, in the transmission line also. So that is a major challenge. And in terms from the utilitary point of view, I feel the grid stability is also a challenge, you know. We need to have more technology, more innovation, more, you know, uh, capacity, you know, in terms of know-how to how to manage your grid, you know, because after all, you know, with, uh, with intermittent energy, that is definitely a challenge, you know. We need to have good policies, you know, where, and at the same time good uh, framework for everyone to come and operate uh, and in terms of gas I would say that you know uh, from the industry point of view now with so much of uh, everyone wants to export you know for the export readiness it's very important for them to have you know that green tag so for example Morbi which is the largest ceramic cluster of, of the world I would say you know earlier many years back they were just running on fossil fuel now the entire industry has switched to cleaner uh, you right. know, to gas-based, uh, you know, uh, you know, plants are there. So I, I think that's happening. Maybe the pace needs to be accelerated more in the industry. But that realization is there. Definitely, the challenges are more investment tie-ups and the good framework where all everyone can operate. I think these are some of the things in which uh, you know. But everyone is working together. And the good thing is that hope is there. And the good thing is that we are all talking and moving in the right direction. Yeah. All right. Uh, well. I'm Tavar Machi, Mr. Rahman, thank you both so much for being with us. And that's all we have time for on this session, but we certainly hope these conversations go forward and uh, we can jointly find solutions and partnerships that will help solve some of the issues around the transition. So I'm going to leave it there for the moment and hand it back to Edi. Edi. Thank you very much. Fascinating conversation.